Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, today is uh, December 1st, uh, 2023. Uh, proud to have uh, Dr. Terry Grossman, our Chief Medical Advisor uh, with AgesRx, uh, here today to talk about um, uh, the topic today is weight, body composition, and longevity. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Z. Uh, obviously, uh, given how many people are struggling with weight issues, both in the United States and worldwide, this is a, a public health, literally a crisis. And for all of us in a anti-aging longevity community, one of the pillars of longevity is attaining a good body weight. So um, why don't we just uh, begin? Uh, I have some slides prepared and we'll just go over the slides and use those um, kind of as our guideline. So I'm gonna begin. All right, um, so we'll be talking, as you'd mentioned, about the connection between weight and longevity and with emphasis on what we can do to control our weight better. So before we get going, let's talk a little bit about the nature of the problem. Uh, it's, it's enormous. Right now, three out of four Americans are either overweight or obese. And what's interesting is the largest group is the obese almost 42% of adults over 20 are obese, about 32% are overweight. So, you know, if you're, uh, if you're not overweight, you're kind of a minority group. So it, it's a, it's a very serious problem. Um, this is the distribution of where uh, overweight and obesity is found. If we look at states like Mississippi and West Virginia, the obesity rates are over 50 percent so uh and that's not overweight that's obesity uh the lowest state is where i live in colorado but even so in colorado the obesity rates in colorado if we were to compare them to what they were 30 years ago we would be the most obese state in the united states so they've increased everywhere uh and they're uh continuing to go up uh, they've increased dramatically over time. In 1962, only 13 percent of the United States was obese. And now I think we're at, what, 41 percent? So it's almost more than tripled. But what are the, the links between longevity and our weight issues? So overweight, being overweight has been linked to several issues that uh, affect both how well we age and how long we can live. Number one is what they refer to as all cause mortality, which is death from all causes. Basically being overweight increases your risk of dying from everything, whether it's cancer, heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, everything is increased by being overweight. Being overweight increases high blood pressure, your risk of type two diabetes and your risk of cancer. So uh, all of these very serious health conditions and our leading causes of death are the direct result uh, and related to obesity and overweight. So relative to a normal weight, obesity, which is having a body mass index over 30, and then uh, kind of that's obesity, period. Body mass index 35 to 40 is called class 2, and greater than 40 is considered severe obesity. Uh, the, the higher you go on the scale, the higher the hazard ratio for mortality. So for people with a body mass index over 30, it's 18% higher. And for, for people with the body mass index over 35, it's 29. So we know where we fall in this group. Um, this study said that modern obesity takes years off of the life expectancy. And this was an analysis of almost 1 million people worldwide. Moderate obesity decreased three years, severe obesity, 10 years. This amount is equivalent to a decrease in life expectancy that we would see with lifelong cigarette smoking. So the risks of overweight are very considerable. 
So whatever we can do to lower our weight is clearly an important part of our longevity program. So we had mentioned that overweight and obesity can lead to high blood pressure and cardiovascular disease. Obesity leads to the development of cardiovascular disease, independent of other cardiovascular risk factors like high blood pressure, family history, cigarette smoking, uh, and high cholesterol. So just obesity is another risk factor in and of itself. In some conditions like type 2 diabetes, the benefits that result in your blood sugar from weight loss will remain even if people regain some weight. So it's like you reset your clock when you lose weight. Uh, blood pressure readings, though, uh, are directly correlated with weight. And uh, if you regain the weight, the blood pressure will come back up. There is a direct correlation, and it's truly an epidemic of what's going on with type 2 diabetes in the world. When we look at type 2 diabetes, which is the one that is associated with overweight, not the insulin dependent that we see in childhood typically, but type 2 diabetes has increased 15 times <clears throat> over the past 35 years. So we go back to 1985, which isn't really that long ago, there were 30 million type 2 diabetics in the world, where today we're approaching half a billion, and it's 4.6% of the world population. Uh, now is that is that is that people who are formally diagnosed? Because I know I know there are a fair number of people, especially in, in developing countries, that go undiagnosed. Yeah, I think I don't think this is diagnosed. I think this mm -hmm. is estimates. Estimates, okay. Yeah. yeah, how many there would be? Sure, sure. And I know like like the whole thing about adult mm -hmm. onset versus you know child on onset. That was that kind of used to be the old name of uh, you know type two diabetes, type one diabetes. I know that uh, those lines have been blurred because you know you know, there's been a recent surge in, 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 you know, adolescents, you know, teenagers getting type 2 diabetes, where historically they would, you know, you'd never, you'd never see diabetes, adult onset diabetes before the age of like 40 or 50. Um, you know, uh, you're exactly so, right. Yeah. Uh, back, you know, uh, in our training, uh, I remember that when I was in medical school, we were taught that type diabetes was called childhood diabetes. That's one you need insulin. And then type 2 diabetes was adult onset diabetes. Then as the incidence of overweight in childhood began to go up, they they coined a new phrase because some of the children were getting diabetic and adolescents were getting diabetic. They called it MODI, maturity onset diabetes of the young. Now they don't even bother because there's so many uh, children and adolescents who have diabetes. So... The, the lines have become blurred quite a bit. The bottom line is that as we uh, gain weight, the risk of getting type 2 diabetes increases dramatically. And as we lose weight, the chances of type 2 diabetes going away increase. So if you do some of the things we'll be talking about later in terms of checking your blood sugar, and if you find that you're a pre-diabetic or early diabetic type 2, by taking aggressive action now, this is a disease that can be reversed. Type one diabetes cannot, but type two can. Yeah, one of the one of the tricky things about diagnosing in, in certain uh, populations, um, you know, we, you're seeing we're seeing type two diabetes in people who are not even like technically obese. You know, they may be a little bit overweight or sometimes even normal weight, uh, but something about their physiology throws them into diabetes. Um, and uh, uh, you know that 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 tends to be more common among certain populations. The population that comes to mind are like southeastern Asian, you know, people from you know uh, India and, and and that part of the world, um, uh, where where you know they have a you know normal or maybe even a slightly overweight um, a body, you know, BMI, and yet and yet they have profound insulin resistance to the point of diabetes. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Some people have a tendency, even though they eat badly, they eat a, a lot of processed carbohydrates, they eat a lot of sugary foods. And they don't really gain weight, but they still get diabetes. So uh, we don't typically see type 2 diabetes in people of normal weight unless they make some dietary indiscretions, let's say. Um, there is a direct correlation between our number two cause of death, cancer, number one's heart disease, and being overweight. There's eight, 684,000 cancers associated with overweight. Being overweight or obese uh, increases, they've found 13 cancers 
and they include some of the most common ones, breast, colon, stomach, uterine cancer, pancreatic, liver, kidneys, and more. So what's interesting is these uh, cancers associated with overweight have been going up and up, but the cancers that are not associated with overweight have been going down or staying the same. So the overweight is increasing these specific cancers. Yeah. And as, I mean, what is it about? What do you think is it about weight gain? It's, it's you know, the insulin drives, you know, it's a growth factor, it tends to drive abnormal growth. I think part of it is uh, the inflammatory milieu of, of, of just, you know, having that uh, metabolic disturbance. Um, and it's probably also there's some dietary issues as well. You know, we talked about, you know, processed foods and things like that. that that's probably why we see an increase in colon cancer, for example. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think we also should look at what food cancer cells can eat. Cancer cells are very streamlined cells. They're kind of stupid cells. They can't eat protein. They can't eat fat. They can only eat sugar, glucose. And so one of the best things that a person who's diagnosed with cancer, one of the first things they should do is drastically reduce their consumption of sugar to help starve the cancer. And by the same token, by eating foods that turn into sugar easily or eating sugar itself, we are going to increase our risk of getting cancer. So it makes a lot of sense to do those things as well. And then you, as you mentioned, some of the growth factors and in insulin and things like that, they play a role as well. Having a low insulin level is like a protective thing against cancer. So the, how do we determine uh, where we are in terms of our uh, whether we, we're obese or not? Scale weight sometimes doesn't tell all the answer, but we can look at body mass index, which is calculated, uh, DEXA scans, um, what's called plethysmography, and then some more sophisticated uh, techniques that are mostly used for research. So the most simple one is called the BMI, body mass index, and you can calculate it on yourself right now. Uh, and if you look here where I said it's easy to calculate, so a 172 man, pound man who's 72 inches tall has a body mass index of 23.3. And that's me. I did the calculations for myself. So that puts me in the normal range. Uh, when we look up above, we see that underweight is a body mass index less than 18.5. Normal is 18.5 to 24.9. Overweight, 24.9, 29.9. And then over 30 is obese and over 35 is extremely obese. These are useful, but I found that sometimes they're not useful, particularly for men who are very muscular. They might have a, you know, 30 or 40 pounds of muscle on their frame. And this, if we just use their weight and their height for this calculation, they might come out as overweight or obese, even though that's hardly the case. In addition, there are other things like you'd mentioned, Southeast Asians, that this thing doesn't really apply to, but nonetheless, it's a useful starting point. So, so based on this, what I, well, one of the questions we might as well ask, answer here is, uh, what what is the kind of the optimal BMI for for um, for for longevity and health? Well, uh, I think too low, yeah, too low, and it's it's you're probably not a good thing. You know, you're you're probably you know starving yourself, probably not getting. There's probably a lot of nutrients somebody's missing. Or, or there's probably some medic, medical condition causing somebody to be, you know, you know, really underweight. Um, yeah, you're actually right. Um, when we look at the normal BMI of 18 and a half to 24.9, I think being in that range uh, is associated with the greatest longevity. I don't think being below 18.5 confers additional longevity, you know, uh, and, you know, a BMI of 18.5 is actually pretty thin. So, um, and below that, people start to look unhealthy, uh, yeah. the skin and bone appearance. So, uh, I think a BMI of 20 to 22 to 23 really is quite good. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, at, at, a, at a lower BMR, by BMI lower than 20, you, you know, person probably doesn't have very much in the way of muscle mass. Um, and that, not, that could yeah. potentially, yeah, that could potentially be a problem as well. Uh, well, the BMI is a lot more accurate in women than it is in men. Really? Okay. Yeah. I did not know that. Okay. Yeah. It, because of the muscle mass of men. It, ah, yes, it, yes. I don't think the BMI is as accurate. Yeah. 
Yeah, there was there was a question about that as well, and uh, and I think we can talk about. Well, I think we'll we'll get to that in terms of like what how does somebody like determine their optimal weight if they have, you know, if if they're working towards a, a bigger muscle mass. Yeah, I mean, it, just get the bigger muscle mass and don't worry about your BMI. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think we'll talk about that when we talk about the DEXA scan here in a minute. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. And you see where it says on the top line, the calculation is your weight in pounds divided by your height squared times 703. I mean, if you don't want to do that calculation, you can just go online and mm -hmm. put in BMI calculator and you put in your weight and your height and it'll tell you what your BMI is. Yeah. So this is widely available. Um, so there's another scan called the DEXA scan. It tells us how much body fat we have, how much fat is visceral fat, which is a toxic fat that's associated with health risks. The DEXA scan is commonly also done as a diagnostic test for uh, osteopenia and osteoporosis because it checks body uh, bone mineral density and also it checks for lean body mass. So this is a, a great scan to have. And this yeah. is what oh, I'm a, a, I'm, like. yeah, I'm a huge fan, but but full disclosure. So I, I, there's a there's a company called DEXAFIT. So I'm an advisor for them. And I actually actually own the Detroit location um, for for Dexafit. So uh, um, so that's one of the there there are many facilities that where you can do a body composition, uh, and uh, you know uh, uh, you know so for those looking you know where do you can where where do you where you can go to get it? I mean, you can't just go to a hospital, knock on their door, and say, hey, can I get a Dexa scan? Um, uh, they'll, they'll they'll probably think you're there for bone mineral density. Uh, but what you really want is a composition body, you know, DEXA body composition scan, uh, and and not not every uh, DEXA scanner out there has the software on it to do a body composition, and uh, and and I'd say probably ninety percent of the facilities out there don't even know that, that their DEXA scan can actually a DEXA scanner can actually do a composition. Right, you're exactly right. So uh, if you want to do it, just go ahead and um, you know make sure that the facility will do body composition as well as bone density. And this, this is a, a typical uh, body composition DEXA scan. And we see that fat is in uh, yellow and muscle is in orange. And the individual on the left uh, would clearly be obese. Individual and uh, individual on the right uh, would be kind of a normal weight. We had mentioned visceral fat. Visceral fat is the fat that is not underneath your skin. So when you pinch an inch around your belly, that's not visceral fat. That's plain abdominal fat, subcutaneous fat. And this visceral fat is much more uh, associated with uh, biomarkers for health. And when you have larger amounts of visceral fat, often that fat is found in the liver as well creating this condition called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which uh, can lead to hepatitis and cirrhosis if it goes on for long enough. So we can see where this fat is. So uh, if you can see my arrow here, this is a subcutaneous fat. This is stuff we can pinch. It's right underneath the skin. But this is a visceral fat here. So you can't really feel it, but this is the stuff they can get inside your liver. It surrounds the heart uh, and it creates a lot of metabolic problems. And when you do uh, a DEXA scan, it will tell you how much visceral fat you have. And really it's not very much. Most people are supposed to have literally like two liters. Um, yeah. So not very much at all. But as you lose subcutaneous fat, the belly fat, you will automatically lose the visceral fat. Right. Not, not always. Like it, it depends on how you lose it. <laughs> so, if you, right. so if you go for a liposuction, yeah, yeah, if you go for a liposuction or like yeah, one right. of those cool sculpting <laughs> or something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're, I mean, that, that's that's typically why liposuction and cool sculpting, you know, usually that fat comes back pretty quickly uh, right. or, or gets redeposited somewhere else because you have not, you know, undergone the metabolic changes required. Um, you, you mentioned measuring it in liters, uh, you know, typically, you know, some of these, uh, uh, you know, some of these facilities that, that give you like a nice, uh, you know, uh, a patient friendly report. I think you mentioned one of them in your previous slides. 
um, you know, uh, we'll, we'll give it to you in pounds. Um, and you really want like one pound or less of, of visceral fat. Yeah, exactly. And I think that is about two liters. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. It, so it, I have uh, in my office, it's not a DEXA scan, but it's uh, a different machine and it uses ultrasound and it's able to calculate visceral fat, uh, skeletal muscle mass, uh, subcutaneous fat, et cetera. So my particular machine uh, gives me the answers in liters. Got it. And I go, going back to uh, subcutaneous fat for a moment, um, what, 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 what is kind of like, what somebody should, what should somebody strive for in terms of uh, the, the percent of, of body fat? Well, it was what we talked about uh, before uh, in, in terms of women, women as a general rule of thumb uh, should be about 20 to 26% body fat and men should be less, about 8% less. So we say that men, uh, 12 to 20, okay. women need that extra fat. Uh, it just, you know, we're made differently. So a woman who is at a uh, body fat of say 23 will look very slender and good and healthy. Whereas a man with a uh, body fat of 23% would look overweight. And the, the equivalent man would be more like 17 so, uh, but those are the general uh, numbers that we typically use. Yeah, and 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 going back to that whole discussion with under being underweight, uh, there are actually some some dangers for women to be um, have have too little body fat. Um, in medical school, we learned uh, about the female athlete triad, um, with you know, and, and that that name came about from you know from young women who were training way too hard, you know, training too much. Uh, you know, not eating enough, and they get their body fat down. I think below that twenty percent level, and uh, and they would stop having uh, their cycles. It would it would cause yeah, uh, significant, yeah, significant hormone disruption, things like that. So it is important to, with with life. You know, balance is you know, there's a lot to say, be said about balance. Yeah, we can go a little bit off topic for a second. Uh, the way that estrogen is created in the body is it's. Uh, there's a chemical process called aromatization and testosterone is aromatized to become estrogen. Well, the aromatization process occurs in fat. And if a woman does not have enough fat, she won't be able to create the estrogen she needs both to have normal periods. So uh, female gymnasts, for instance, often uh, develop amenorrhea or lack of periods due to their very uh, low body fat amounts. And then women who train hard, as you've mentioned, the triathletes, some of them have difficulty conceiving or getting pregnant because they don't have enough body fat to make the estrogen to in turn be able to achieve pregnancy. So there is, you know, too much of a good thing is not a good thing. Um, so what are the actions that we can take? We've kind of spent our time so far discussing the problem and how to measure it. So what are we going to do about it? Well, uh, weight is directly related to um, glucose and insulin levels. So it's very, it's hard to measure insulin levels, but we can get a rough idea what they are uh, from uh, blood work, or you can ask the doctor to run an insulin level. They have to know how to collect the blood specimen because it has to be done fasting and frozen and things like that. But it's good to know what your insulin level is. Uh, but it's easier to check your glucose. And we'll be talking about the use of the CGMs, the continuous glucose monitors that are available as well. So the negative things are eating the high glycemic index foods. Those are the ones that turn into sugar quickly. And the photo of the, uh, the ice cream with the whipped cream and fruit uh, would be a high glycemic index carbohydrate food, one that we kind of want to stay away from. And one of the interesting things is exercise will lower your blood sugar and lower your insulin level. Uh, so uh, lack of exercise will do just the opposite. You will increase your insulin level and make it easier for you to gain weight. So it really is what Jack Lane used to say years ago. Uh, Jack Lane lived to be almost 100, and he was a fitness guru of uh, the 60s, 70s, 80s. That was uh, the time that he was around. And he said, exercise is king. 
die as queen and put them together and you have a kingdom. And I think he hit it right on the head. Is you know we, we'll, we'll talk about other things we could take, but really diet and exercise are the foundational properties that we need to do to keep our weight down and to keep ourselves healthy. Yeah, what's what's ironic about ice cream is that you know it does have some fat in it. You know, depending on depending on the ice cream, so it actually the fat can actually slow down the absorption of um, of, of of the sugar uh, in, in in the ice cream. And so there's there's almost two things. There's a glycemic index is like glycemic load. So, so an ice cream might have a high, you can have a food like ice cream that can have a high glycemic load, but may potentially even have a low glycemic index because of other factors like fat and protein. So that we're not, you know, we don't necessarily need to get into that level of detail, but I just want to make, make patients aware of it. Uh, uh, and you actually, ideally you want to avoid foods that, that are high in both, uh, but they're not always uh, um, like, this, you know, that they're not always equal to each other. No, exactly. But you raise a good point. And that is, for instance, which is, quote, healthier, <clears throat> a bowl of haagen high fat ice cream or a bowl of sorbet, which has no fat in it at all? Well, actually, the haagen with the fat will, the fat delays gastric emptying. So the sugar is going to enter your bloodstream a lot more slowly. The, the sorbet has no fat in it. It's just going to hit your bloodstream, boom. And, you know, you'll actually gain more weight eating sorbet, even though it's lower calorie, than you will haagen ice cream or some high-fat ice cream like that. So um, I'm a vegan personally, and I've recently changed my diet. So, you know, I might go to a restaurant, and there's literally nothing for me to eat on the menu other than a baked potato and salad. So <clears throat> because <clears throat> the baked potato is a high glycemic food, I make sure to put something on it that's got fat, whether it's olive oil or something like that, to decrease its glycemic index. <clears throat> so it doesn't just go straight in the blood stream of sugar. I was going to say butter, but in your case, <laughs> if you're trying to go well, vegan. <laughs> at home, I can use vegan butter. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Good, good to know. Good to know. And we could talk a little bit more about that if, if we talk about CGM and kind of like how to use the CGM strategically uh, <clears> to, to, exactly. to prevent those, those spikes. <clears throat> so the way that glucose <clears throat> translates into obesity <clears throat> is by raising levels of insulin. So insulin levels that are high <clears throat> are sufficient to suppress the breakdown of fat and promote production of fat. So insulin really has a lot to say about whether we're going to burn fat or make fat. So we want to keep our insulin levels low. And the way to do that is to avoid the high glycemic index foods. <clears throat> so lifestyle is most important. Uh, in this study done by Andrew Friedman, who's uh, a cardiologist here in Denver at National Jewish Hospital, he said lifestyle modifications should be the primary focus when treating insulin resistance. Nutritional intervention by reducing calories and avoiding carbs <clears throat> that stimulate excess insulin is a cornerstone. Physical activity is so important. And then medications can also improve it. So he begins with those foundational things of diet and exercise. <clears throat> How about something we're hearing a lot about these days? <clears throat> Either intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating. More and more people that I talk to in my practice tell me that they're doing some form of time-restricted eating. So what does this look like? The standard American diet, the SAD diet, <clears throat> is basically people, I have it backwards, I think, it should be 9 15. Nine hours of uh, food, maybe that. Yeah, I have it backwards. It, it would be nine hours of fasting and 15 hours of food. <clears throat> um, yeah, no, you have it right. No, you have, you have 15 hours food, nine hours no food. Yeah, yeah so, so you got it right down. Well, no, most people do it this way. Um, oh, you're talking about intermittent fasting. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so see, it, should, it should really be nine, 15, nine hours of <clears throat> fasting, 15 hours of food. <clears throat> um, the minimum that we should be doing is 12-12, where let's say we finish eating supper at seven, 
p.m. at night. We don't start eating again until 7 a.m. in the morning. That's something that really most of us should be doing all the time. And what that means is when you finish eating supper <clears throat> at 7 p.m., that's it. No cocktails, no fruit, no late night snacking, no calories. Water is okay. And in the morning, we don't consume any calories till 7 a.m. So if you're going to have tea or coffee, it needs to be black. No calories. And it can't have no calorie sweetener in it. Because when you do the no calorie sweetener, even that will raise your insulin level. So you have to have a clean fast. There are some exceptions to that. You know, I have some patients, uh, you know, while they're trying to fix their metabolism, sometimes they suffer from uh, noc nocturnal hypoglycemia. You know, you know, hypoglycemia, low, low blood sugar at night. Sometimes it disturbs their sleep. So for, for 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 certain patients, you know, this this goes for somebody who's otherwise healthy doesn't have, um, you know, yeah. there's there's just. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. You know, healthy yeah. people that don't have episodes right. of aggressive. Right. Obviously, those are uh, exceptions. Yeah, but for the people who do suffer from like low blood sugar and, and is disturbing their sleep. I mean, there's there's usually like underlying metabolic uh, issues that are going on, and you need to fix those. But while you're fixing those, sometimes I recommend like a uh, uh, like a like a protein based snack to kind of keep the, the the blood sugar stable. Certainly, sure. don't want to do anything with carbohydrates at night. Um, you know, because that 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 that's a recipe for a crash for a, for a blood sugar crash at night at bedtime. Well, let's um, assume let's assume that you know you don't have those problems. You're not suffer from hypoglycemia then you want to start at 12, 12 all the time. And then the health benefits really begin when you're fasting for 14 hours a day. And that's pretty easy to do. If you finish eating supper at seven, just delay your breakfast until nine. You know, have black coffee or whatever for your first cup of coffee and then, or a cup of green tea in the morning. And then after nine, you can have, you know, something else that has um, calories in it. Things get better when we go up to the 16-8 program. So where you do in that case is say you finish eating supper at 6.30, then you don't want to have anything until maybe a snack at 10.30. And then things get even better yet at the 18-6 or the 24 programs. So if you're doing 18-6, you really have to skip a meal. So uh, in order to do that, so let's say you finish supper at 6 p.m., then you really uh, can't have breakfast and you just start eating at noon. And what I do personally is I try to do two or three days a week of 18.6, two days a week of 16.8, maybe on the weekends, 14.10, or if I'm going out of town or something, 14.10. Uh, and if it's just an exceptional you know, party and whatnot, I never go beyond the 12.12. And I'm very, very strict about no calories or artificial sweeteners or anything for those 12 hours a day. And I think that that's where everybody should start to begin. So I've developed a couple uh, quotes about intermittent fasting. And the first quote I have is, the more time you spend eating, the less time you'll spend living. Which is an interesting thing, because our metabolism wasn't made for us to be eaten all the time. We were designed to fast on a regular basis. And the converse is the less time you spend eating, the more time you'll have for living. <clears throat> uh, this was not lost on one of the most uh, important people in the world today, the Dalai Lama. We don't typically regard him as um, a nutritionist, but he was given a lecture in Pittsburgh. And at the end of his lecture, somebody in the back of the audience raised his hand and said, your holiness what in a simple statement would be your advice for the people of America? And this is what he said, eat less. So there's a lot to be said for the less you eat, the longer you live. Kind of an easy way to remember things. So let's turn from lifestyle to medications. First one we'll talk about is metformin. We've talked about it before. Metformin is I think a foundational medicine currently undergoing NIH trials. Uh, to, to see if it truly is an anti-aging medication. I think it is. I've been on it myself for about 15 plus years. Uh, it's the most commonly prescribed anti-diabetic drug in the world. It's been around for 65, 70 years. When we get at higher doses, like 1,500 milligrams a day, <clears throat> some patients experience 
weight loss. It's FDA approved for type two diabetes. Uh, it's used for some other conditions uh, and it does promote weight loss at the higher doses. So that's not, not for everybody. Therapy. Yeah, but that that's kind of typical of any any therapy for weight loss is, is you know, even even some of the more potent drugs we'll talk about. I mean, even then you look at the study, not 100 percent, you know, it's not 100 percent. You know, there were there's there were still some people even in the uh, in the on the potent drugs that we'll talk about that didn't lose weight. And that 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 just kind of highlights the complexity of human nature and human biology. Yeah, absolutely. This is a uh, a mouse experiment. And it shows that the black black is the mouse that were given metformin. The red are the control mice who didn't get metformin. That as they got older, uh, there was less weight gain in the mice that took metformin. So it occurred right until the very end of their life. And then yeah. similarly, they ate less calories as well, particularly later in life. Uh, the ones that took metformin compared to the control animals. Well, I have, I've not seen this study before. It's a very interesting study. I, I, I commonly look at the human studies, so that's probably why I haven't look, uh, ran into it. Um, but but I see that clinically. So so when when I have patients who start metformin, um, you know, they may or may not lose weight on metformin. You know, sometimes it will probably about maybe sixty percent of people who try metformin, maybe seventy, depending on you know what else you're doing, will lose weight. But that leaves like thirty or forty percent who probably who may not. Um, but I tell them, you know, <clears throat> it, it'll it'll likely help prevent further weight gain. Um, exactly. Because especially it makes, you know, for, for humans, especially human females, they undergo that menopause in their, you know, 45 to 55, you know, and, and, and that's where, uh, you know, weight gain tends to be a, a, a big complaint among, among women in that age group. And I'll commonly recommend, you know, hey, you know, if you're 45 heading towards menopause, you know, you might want to put the brakes a little bit on weight loss, uh, on weight gain, sorry, from the menopause. Metformin might be one of those tools. Um, of course, it's not exactly. for everybody. And that's kind of where, you know, having a, having a, a doctor familiar with prescribing metformin needs, needs to uh, evaluate a patient um, to, to see if it's appropriate for them. Yeah, we shouldn't really be looking at metformin as a weight loss drug. It's more of a metabolic drug. It's good for your metabolism. It's good for your lifespan. It's good for cancer prevention. It's good for a lot of things. But don't expect to lose, lose more than three to five pounds with metformin. Uh, studies show up to 10, you know, again, depending on the study and things like that. It is, it is a mild, it's considered to be a mild, but every little bit helps. I mean, you yeah, know, exactly. yeah, yeah. And, and like I said, even, even just preventing further weight gain is, is, is a big deal as well, I think. And, and, and yeah. You know, so I think for most of us over the age of 35, <clears throat> considering metformin as part of our anti-aging toolbox is a really good idea. And we we talked about metformin extensively before, so you don't just have to right. <laughs> have to beat it to death again here. Right. Uh, this just showed that you know having high blood sugar is so bad that uh, it crosses the blood brain barrier, and they talk about type three diabetes now, which is diabetes of the brain, <clears throat> which is a risk factor for Alzheimer's. Another thing that some people do is there's these injections that are available. They're called MIC MIC. And they include methionine and acetol and choline. They're typically uh, you add B12 with that. And when these injections are done in combination with healthy lifestyle, they help the body uh, to break down fat more easily and promote weight loss and build up muscle mass. So that's another thing that can be done as well. <clears throat> so how about what's available in the quantified self movement? Uh, how can the quantified self uh, therapies and strategies available help us to lose weight. Well, we have the um, continuous glucose monitors and we can, with the use of these, uh, we've had a CGM on, we can find out which foods raise our blood sugars the most. And anytime our blood sugar goes up, our insulin goes up, and we know when our insulin goes up, we stop breaking down fat and make fat. So we don't have to do the finger sticks anymore. We can know our blood sugar a hundred times a day if we want to. And in particular, we can do a little bit of a study on ourselves. Everybody reacts differently. Like one person, they eat white bread and they don't have a problem with it. Somebody else eats white bread and their blood sugar goes through the roof. Someone else eats pasta, no problem. Someone else eats pasta, blood sugar goes high. You'll find out which foods are the ones that are gonna raise your blood sugar the most. And you can either avoid them or there are some strategies you can use 
to enable you to eat them that we'll talk about in a minute. So these CGMs are not just for diabetics. Um, I don't know what the current status is, whether you need a doctor's prescription to get one or not. You did until recently. I think you still do, but you should be able to, uh, you know, have your doctor prescribe one. Uh, and they're not terribly expensive, but they're not free either. So if, if you don't have diabetes, you might just use it for a month or two to find out which are the offending foods and how you can deal with it. And then you really don't need to use it forever. Yeah, you know, they're definitely not over the counter yet. I, I've heard in, in Canada they are uh, potentially, although I haven't verified that. Uh, but no, here in the States, you definitely need a doctor's order. I right. mean, that, that's, that's what we we offer it. We offer that as, at HSRX as well. But if, if you know, somebody out there has a doctor willing to write them a, a prescription for CGM, um, it, it, it probably won't be covered under insurance, so they'll end up self-paying. Uh, well, well, yeah, no, even... Even diabetics with insurance, it often doesn't pay for it. Yeah. But, you know, the next yeah, time yeah, insurance gives them really with, time. Uh, yeah. you know, with ageless, just ask for a prescription if you want to try this. That would be the easiest way because a lot of doctors don't really want to prescribe this for non-diabetics. Yeah. Yeah. And and I agree with your use hmm. of it. I mean, I mean, some people like using it indefinitely because it really kind of, you know, it's one of those things they really like to nerd out on, for lack of better terms. Uh, other patients, I tell them to use it more strategically. You know, uh, you know, two weeks or four weeks every six months, twelve months, uh, just to make sure uh, that that you know they're keeping themselves honest in terms of not because some people like, like try to they like to incorporate new foods um, and and that 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 can be healthy. I mean, I mean, variety of diet is is very healthy for people, I think. Uh, but uh, with that comes along with there's always a chance that the, that the foods that you're incorporating you may think are healthy but actually can spike your sugar. So I think that's why uh, strategically using a CGM sensor once a year, once every six months is a really good idea. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is a slide <clears throat> from Dr. McDougall. Dr. McDougall is an advocate of veganism. Um, he's written books on that. And he shows what happens to your blood sugar <clears throat> when you have glucose or sugar. It spikes quite high as, comp as compared to what happens uh, when you eat beans, which have a very low glycemic index. So we have a much lower spike um, <clears throat> that occurs later when you eat beans as opposed to sugar. So this is the kind of information that a CGM can give you. This was one especially where the especially CGM... The new, was, sorry, especially the new one, the Freestyle 3, um, that has actually a Bluetooth connection now. Uh, and through the app, it actually, I think it gives you like a... a, a uh, every five minutes, every minute or five minutes, I can't remember which, it, it actually gives it gives you the reading. Uh, whereas the the previous versions, uh, you actually have to scan your phone to this sensor. Right. Uh, so the three is a big improvement. Um, and you know we've offered the three for probably six months now, I think. Yeah, they're getting better and better. Better and better. Yeah. <clears throat> so this shows the various CGM responses of your blood sugar to different foods. So the yellow one. Uh, is a sweet potato and it is the highest interestingly um the red one is a white potato and a lot of us think that you know eating uh sweet potatoes have less of a glycemic load or index than a white potato uh, perhaps not uh the next thing spike is cheerios and then you know as we get down to the bottom the purple one um that's lentils. Lentils have a very low glycemic index. So you can do this experiments on yourself and find out, does your body, you know, does your blood sugar spike with white rice and not with brown rice or vice versa, things like that. So you can get a lot of information from the CGM. Um, <clears throat> this is the different food types. When you eat a carbohydrate dominant food, uh, you get an early spike in blood sugar. When you eat more protein dominant food, you get not as high a spike in blood sugar, and it occurs more gradual. And when you eat fat, you get almost no spike in blood sugar. And that's kind of the key behind the keto diets and things like that. We eat a very high fat diet. And I think by combining these food groups, we can get the best of all worlds. We don't want to get in this blood sugar roller coaster. So we're, you know, we 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 have a high glycemic food, up goes our blood sugar in the red. So uh, insulin levels go up, insulin drive blood sugars down. Then by lunchtime, we have low blood sugar, so we're hungry, we eat ravenously. Boom, our blood sugar spikes into the middle of the day, mid-afternoon, we're hungry again. So we eat more foods, 
Then we get another bit of a 3 p.m. slump, eat more food. So this, you know, we just kind of continuously eating. We get sugar cravings and things like that. We can smooth this out by having a lower glycemic diet to begin with. <clears throat> so we should be eating salad and veggies before we eat other things. So what this study showed, and this is from uh, the Glucose Goddess website, uh, here was a person who had pasta, and here's their blood sugar spike. It goes high. And here's someone who had a salad first, and then pasta, and we see the blood sugar spike was much blunted. Same thing with pizza. The blood sugar spike was fairly high with the pizza. When they had a green salad first and then the pizza, they didn't even spike at all. They stayed in the green range. So as we eat, what we eat when makes a difference. So it says life is short, eat desserts first. Well, actually, that's completely wrong. So we don't eat sweets alone. This was what happened to uh, blood sugar when someone, and all of these come from the Greek Goddess website, uh, they show what happens when uh, you eat a sweet like pineapple. It's a pretty sugary tropical fruit. The blood sugar goes up. What happens if you have a meal and then have pineapple for your dessert? It doesn't go up nearly as much. So we can come up with some plans for how we eat. In addition, taking a walk after you eat will drastically cut your blood sugar. So going for a 15 to 30 minute walk after meals can be very, very helpful in reducing your blood sugar level after meals. We it's don't because the, uh, the muscles, the muscles take in the, uh, the, the extra absolutely. as well. So exercise yeah, so forces the sugar into the muscles. Yep. Yeah. Otherwise it gets, you know, uh, that insulin, sorry, the insulin and the glucose build up and it, and it kind of, it has to go somewhere. So usually shoved into the fat cells. Right. Uh, and, and that, that could be very detrimental. So you don't need to avoid uh, carbs and sugars completely. You just need to be smart about when and how you eat them. So what are our anti-aging tools, uh, toolkit to level blood sugar and insulin? Number one, uh, less sugar and starchy foods to begin with, more exercise and weight loss, metformin for virtually everybody, measure your hemoglobin A1C, which is your average blood sugar for three to four months, and the CGM. And then we have a carbose, which can smooth things out. And that'll be the last thing we talk about. Um, some other simple things, don't eat sweets for breakfast. Eat eggs, veggies, salmon, instead of pancakes and syrup or bagels. Save sweets for times after you've eaten other foods, fat in particular. So here's the ideal meal progression. You begin with the veggies and salad, then you have the proteins and fats, and then finally have the starches and sugars, and you take a walk after you've eaten. So this is the best thing that you can do to smooth out your blood sugar level altogether with your lifestyle. So. You use a CGM, you find out that certain foods raise your, your blood sugar too much, but you love them. You want to be able to eat them. So what you can do is you can take a carbose with meals. A carbose slows down the breakdown of starches into sugar. Now, this isn't going to work for sugar, but it is going to work for starches. So you can, if you discover that pasta makes your blood sugar go up high and you love pasta, well, take a carbos when you have your pasta meal or your potato or your bread or whatever high starch meal you can. So a carbos you can get as a prescription from your doctor. This was a study, again, an animal study, and it showed in red how high the blood sugar went after carbohydrate feeding of the animal. And then the blue shows how high the blood sugar went when a carbos and, uh, was added. So uh, we can really blunt the amount of blood sugar that's released by adding a carbose to our carbohydrate meals. There are some side effects associated with a carbose. Since we're not digesting the carbs as quickly, uh, the starches end up in our colon and they can be affected by the bacteria in the colon. So it commonly are GI related. Some people get bloating and gas and abdominal pain. So I tell people start slow, start with 12.5 milligrams and then gradually work up the smaller the glycemic load of the meal you eat, then the smaller amount of a carbose you take, and then the larger the amount that you take, the more a carbose. So some people will take 25 milligrams with a small meal that has carbs up to 100 milligrams with a large carb meal. So the, the idea of a carbose is it, it blocks the enzyme that breaks down the starch. So the more a carbose right. you take, 
the more of the blocking of the star of that of that amylase enzyme. However, mm -hmm. that means more more of the starch that you've eaten ends up in the colon where the bacteria get to it. Exactly. Um, so here's a simple way to begin. Start with 25 milligrams just once a day, say with supper. Then after a month or two, try 25 milligrams with each starch meal. And then after another month or two, try 50 milligrams with each meal that has starch in it. So that's a simple way to do things. And it really minimizes side effects. How about if these things don't work? So we have the uh, the the new drugs, the semaglutide, the uh, the trisepatide, uh, Ozempic, uh, Majorno, things like that. There are also some uh, diabetes drugs that block sugar. Uh, so these can be done. I'm not going to talk about them, other than to say that you know in the future we can consider talking about them, but not today. So just I want a, just a quick time. sorry, just a quick note, just a quick note about the SGLT2 inhibitors. I mean, they they seem to be really good as a potential longevity therapy, but for some reason they don't really translate to that much of a weight loss. You know, you you think if you were peeing out like a soda can worth of sugar, you'd lose a lot of weight, but there just seems to be something about the body's ability to compensate um, for that for that calorie loss, um, and that's one of the reasons why people have so much difficulty losing weight is uh you're almost like fighting an uphill battle um so what so then this is why this is why medications like the uh, semaglutide and trisepatide are so important uh because um you know it, it's not always as simple as calorie in calorie out i mean that that's kind of you you've got to start with that but you can't for a lot of people it, it's hard to end there just because you're you're, you're fighting uh, evolution you're fighting biology and 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 uh and, and physiology uh, so that's why these these this this class of medication these new class of medications actually uh, I, would, I would consider a lot of people consider them a game changer. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Like, and uh, we'll we'll plan on having a future meet the doctor uh, specifically devoted to these medications. But I would like to leave some time for questions. So uh, why don't we uh, see if we can answer a few questions, Doctor Z? Sure. Actually, we've we've answered most of them as we went along. So. Um, uh, so there's just a, actually a couple questions that are left have to do specifically with this class of medication. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. So actually, like I said, I've, I've pretty much answered all the questions that we've gone along. I've, I've thrown them in there. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Uh, there is actually, let's see, there's a couple new questions in here. I didn't see, um, let's see, uh, one question about metformin, I think, does it help if you're gluten sensitive? I'm not sure what that, that question's about. Well, gluten um, sensitivity yeah. Uh, wouldn't really be helped by metformin. Um, it, you know, if gluten causes, you know, systemic effects, whether it's an upset stomach or other things along those lines, you know, really, you just, there are so many gluten-free alternatives that are available that, you know, the funny thing is people in Europe and other parts of the world have very little gluten problems. And I think it's because the gluten that we eat in the United States comes from genetically modified wheat, and it's not really a natural gluten or a natural wheat, and it seems to cause problems. So it may not even be the gluten itself. It may be the, um, you know, whatever this new uh, genetically modified food is. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a book that came out several years ago called uh, Wheat Belly. I yeah, can't exactly. The doctor wrote it, but he, I think the, the the first or second chapter talks all about the history of 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 uh, a, you know wheat being grown in the United States and talks about how you know sometimes if you're gluten sensitive, you can go to Europe and have and have you know bread there, you know not for celiac, celiac completely different. But I don't want to go into there. <laughs> but anyone interested in learning more, you know, go read uh, Wheat Belly. The the first chapter there is like almost all the information you need to know. Um, a couple of questions, NAD injections. Sorry, it's, it's not that's not our topic today. Uh, you know, ha happy to you know cover it at some point in the future. Um, take uh, take it while taking metformin. I'm 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 assuming uh, are you referring to maybe taking these GLP one uh, with with taking metformin? Um, they can uh, be taken simultaneously. Yes. There are certain diabetic diabetes drugs that should not be taken um, with the semaglutide, but uh, metformin is one of them that they don't interfere with one another. Yeah. And in fact, there, I think if you look at the studies uh, for the original studies on Ozempic, people who are taking Ozempic with metformin actually lost more weight. Um, so so there is a, um, a synergy there. However, 
taking starting both at the same time is not recommended. Usually I tell people start one, you know, make sure you're tolerating it well and then starting the other because they both have overlapping side effects and starting at the same time might might be uh, a little hard for some people. Um, let's see. Uh, a couple other questions here. Um, question about intermittent fasting. Um, can can the 1860, sorry, 186 intermittent fasting be, be done forever like are there any any reasons to believe that that you know it should only be done for certain amounts of time or it could be detrimental for health? no i think that the 186 program is uh sufficiently benign that it can be done constantly but i have found both through my personal experience and with patients as well that you can't like okay well i'm gonna do the intermittent fasting this week and i'm not gonna do it next week you've got to do it if you're going to do it. And that's why I put that baseline. You got to do at least 12, 12 every day. If you go beyond that, you really kind of ruin the whole thing. But if you want to do 18, six all the time, no problems. As long got as it. you have enough calories during the rest of the day. And then have you found like, are there certain people who, who have a hard time tolerating intermittent fasting or fasting in general? Oh yeah. I mean, there are people that quote, have a high metabolism I, and they find fasting very, very difficult. And if you're one of those people well, luckily, we have a lot of other things that we can do that are also beneficial. I mean, no one needs to do everything. So intermittent fasting is a key, and I think it's very, very helpful. But if your particular metabolism makes you very uncomfortable, you're hungry all the time, you're irritable, your blood sugar crashes and things like that, well, you know, intermittent fasting isn't for you. So and then we had nothing a, is for everybody. We had a couple of questions that came in ahead of time. Um, you know, there's some studies that suggest that these GLP-1, uh, GLP-1 agonists can actually have uh, benefits beyond weight loss. Are you familiar with those studies? And what, what are your thoughts oh, on that? Oh, yeah, the evidence is coming out that they're useful in, in alcohol. People who have problems with alcohol addiction uh, find that when they go on uh, these medications, they don't want to drink as much or they don't want to drink at all. There are cardiovascular benefits that are accruing. So I have had patients who don't need to lose any weight at all. They want to be put on a low dose of semaglutide for its cardiovascular benefits. So I, I think that we're only beginning to scratch the surface of what these medications can do for us. Yeah. And then uh, uh, what's your experience with a compound? We had a question about a compound of semaglutide. I know uh, now, you know, since, since uh, some of these drugs are on shortage, the FDA has allowed uh, 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 pharmacies to compound uh, semaglutide. Um, do you find them you know, as toler tolerated, do you have any, do you have any, have any patients who have trouble tolerating them? Uh, like how are they compared to the, you know, the commercially available? I haven't found a difference. And as a general rule of thumb, what I do is if patients are diabetics, I will prescribe the Ozempic uh, in particular, because it's FDA approved for diabetes and it also will help their weight loss, uh, but it's expensive. And if they are not diabetic, then I'll prescribe one of the uh, generic compounded versions. And the weight loss that I've seen with that is virtually indistinguishable from what we see from the name brands. And I believe Aegis is now uh, looking at or has begun to provide some uh, generic versions. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I want to clarify, there's no generic for, for semaglutide. Uh, so it's, it's compounded is a little bit different than generic. Uh, I know it's a little semantics, but uh, okay. uh, but yeah, uh, I just want to clarify that. But yeah, so so we actually started offering compounded semaglutide on a limited basis due to, due to supply constraints. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we are working with some of our partner pharmacies to expand that. Uh, so as of the recording of this, you know, uh, you know December 1st, 2023, in the next couple of weeks, we'll probably expand the, the compound of semaglutide uh, offering to to a wider audience. Um, and 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 the, there's there's several benefits. You know, one benefit obviously is cost. I mean, uh, it's about one third to one quarter of the cost of the uh, of, of Ozempic or Wegovy. Uh, and the other thing is actually allows you to uh, patients to um, to titrate their dose a little bit more um, uh, personal personalizable. <laughs> that's even a term because um, a lot of people. The way that Wagobi and Ozempic come, uh, you know, with, with Ozempic, you have to follow the clicks. And with, uh, with Wagobi, you don't have any choice. It's just a pre-filled pen. And, you know, you either tolerate the dose that you're given or or, or, or you don't. Um, but with the uh, uh, the compounded, uh, it, it's a needle and syringe. 
and and uh, you know it could be a little bit better of a ti uh, guided titration uh, for it. Um, so we're we're, hope we're we're very excited about offering uh, an expansion of of offering the components of Ubertide. Uh, what about um, what about it's? We had a question about metformin and the GLP one. Maybe we can kind of take a take a hit uh, in terms of uh, muscle loss. Um, um, I know I know there's been a lot of controversy in terms of metformin with muscle loss, and I think we covered that in a previous um, in a previous uh, AMA. We have an article on our website. So just long story short, it doesn't seem to to lead to muscle loss, but you may not gain as much muscle taking metformin. So that's, that's kind of where I'm going to leave that question. Uh, but what about the GLP-1, Dr. Gosman? What, what have you seen in terms of, like, do you have any concerns about people actually losing muscle muscle mass while, while on these medications? No, uh, I'm fortunate in having a population who's generally very health conscious. So these people uh, that are uh, taking these medications, the GLP-1 agonists, are also typically working out with weights and living a healthy lifestyle. So I don't know personally if people that don't exercise are going to lose muscle mass to a significant degree. Uh, but I do know that if you do exercise, you won't lose the muscle mass. And I think that with metformin, if you just take your metformin many hours away from when you do your exercise, those uh, potentially negative effects of metformin on muscle mass can be really significantly attenuated. I, I think one of the issues with the clinical trials, uh, you know, that were done by the drug companies were, you know, I think they mostly just said, here, take the medication. And they may have done some counseling on on, 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 on lifestyle, but usually it's very simple counseling. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's, you know, and typically, you know, the, the participants in these clinical trials, they're given the drug for free. They said, here's a drug, you know, and, you know, go, go do some weight, some, some, some weight loss, you know, uh, lifestyle changes, but usually you don't see very much in the way of, of, of lifestyle changes. So there is a right way to use these medications in a wrong way. The wrong way is just continue what you're doing and just take the medications. <laughs> I, I would say that's the wrong way of doing. And that that's probably a recipe for, um, for losing muscle mass, uh, you know, a lot of muscle mass. And, and that, that's, that's where I, I think where you see in the studies, uh, you do see a significant muscle mass loss. Um, uh, or at least this disproportionate amount. Uh, now, I think any weight loss therapy, whether it's working out, whether it's uh, you know medication or you know or even liposuction, for example, you will lose some muscle naturally because you know if you're not carrying twenty or thirty pounds around, you know your leg muscles don't need to work as hard, your back muscles don't need to work as hard, and so your your body tends to shed muscles where it's not needed if there's not a load on it. Um, and so I think any, any weight loss therapy will lead to some muscle loss, unless you purposely counteract that with, with strength training and other exercises. Um, so it's not about the therapy. It's about, you know, what else are you doing with that therapy? Yeah, I agree with that completely. Yeah. All right. Uh, apologize for those questions that we weren't able to get to. Um, you know, uh, if you want to, um, uh, you know, hold on to them for the next time we have an AMA, we'd be glad to try to uh, answer them. Uh, thank you, everybody. I, we, we've gone a little over time here. Thank you. I'd like to thank Dr. Grossman for taking time out of his busy clinical schedule. Um, and uh, 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 and we hope you enjoyed our uh, AMA today. And uh, we look forward to doing many more of these. Bye.